Salam to all of you. I hope everybody is in good shape and in good spirits. This is lecture 9 of our semester 2 syllabus in contemporary US political thought and foreign policy. Today's lecture is about national security document number 68 and how it impacted the containment doctrine and US foreign policy generally. As we shall see as we move on in this presentation, its impact was markedly felt throughout the Cold War era and interestingly enough continues to be felt even today. The lecture is titled NSC 68 and the Globalization of the Containment Doctrine. The lecture comprises five major sections. In section one, I shall share with you a brief historical account of the drafting of NSC 68, which means I'll be touching on the historical context in which the document was thought out and drafted. Section 2 analyzes the document and tries to read between the lines of what we might call metaphorically its diagnosis and its prescription. We shall particularly be interested in three aspects, how the document glamorized US values and purpose, how it demonized the USSR and characterized its nature, intentions and objectives, and what it recommended as necessary steps to adjust the US strategy vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. In section 3, we shall basically try to dive into the fierce intellectual and political wrestling between the so-called hawks and doves of the administration regarding the document. Section 4 touches on how the document became a foreign policy blueprint for American decision makers throughout the Cold War era and perhaps until today. And in section 5, we shall see together the assigned reading material for this lecture. Let me start by reminding you that in this course we are not particularly seeking to provide a factual narrative of U.S. foreign policy or U.S. foreign relations. Far from it. Our interest, in fact, resides in looking into how U.S. political thought in the key decision-making institutions is manufactured and how that influences U.S. foreign policy. Much of that debate is often contradictory and at times heated and even bellicose. Obviously, the factual aspect is important because it clarifies the political thought that lies behind big decisions. But understanding the hows and whys of major political orientations is more important to us here. Here is a brief reminder of the six fundamentals of this course. Factualism is not what we are after here. We try to look beyond decisions, analyze, interpret, and read beyond the lines. We try to probe institutional debates. 
We attempt to understand the whys and hows of decisions and policy orientations. We try to measure the policy shifts and obviously try to interrogate U.S. political thought and political culture. In our previous sessions, we saw how U.S. political thought shaped the country's decision-making process in response to the mounting tension in East-West relations. As you recall, this tension was mainly a direct outcome of what was happening in Europe, especially in Germany. We also said that the Soviet blockade, the U.S. airlift, and the subsequent creation of the Federal Republic of Germany and formation of NATO had plunged American-Soviet relations and East-West relations generally into the darkest days of the Cold War yet to be witnessed. Commentators and strategists at the time repeatedly pulled the alarm bells. In their eyes, the world was actually on the brink of falling into the unknown and perhaps moving head-on into World War III. Two determinant developments were to increase tension in East-West relations and to arouse more worries in the United States and in the West generally. The Communist Revolution led by Mao Zedong achieved victory over America's allies in the Chinese Civil War and the Soviets successfully tested their first atomic bomb. All these developments prompted Secretary of State Dean Acheson to order the policy planning staff to undertake a top-level reassessment of American policy. It was hoped that this reassessment would eventually provide the White House with a coherent strategy in dealing with the Soviet Union. The policy planning staff that was led by Paul Nitzer was actually a think tank group of specialists from the Department of State and the Department of Defense. The outcome of that reassessment, which was carried out between late 1949 and early 1950, was a top secret report that was submitted to President Truman on the 7th of April 1950 was titled United States Objectives and Programs for National Security. It was to be later commonly known as National Security Council Document Number 68 or NSC 68 for short. The document would in fact shape US foreign policy in all its aspects, military, economic, political, and even cultural throughout the Cold War era, and you can say even after. In fact, a lot of what we are seeing today with regard to U.S. interactions with the rest of the world has the flavor of what we might metaphorically call the diagnosis and prescription of this very NSC 68 document. Let's now, if you wish, see how the document diagnosed US foreign policy then in place and what it prescribed to the President as steps for the future, especially with regard to dealing with the Soviet Union. We'll try to give special attention to semantics, 
that is, the specific meanings of the words used in the document, and also the profound connotations that were associated with those words. The document actually went great lengths to glamorize all what the United States stands for in terms of values and purpose, being the land of freedom, of prosperity, and of democratic institutions. It conceded that the conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union had become endemic because the two superpowers were driven by totally antithetical ideals and objectives. These two superpowers were presented in the document as tending for totally antithetical ways of life one based on freedom, that's the American way, and the other based on coercion, that's the Soviet one. Further, the two sides, according to the document, were defending two diametrically opposed visions of the world, one based on freedom and democratic institutions, that's the Western vision, and the other based on subversion and domination, and that's the Soviet one. The document actually portrayed the Soviet Union's nature and objectives in a completely bleak way, to say the least. As an aggressive and hostile power, putting world security in jeopardy and constantly seeking to achieve hegemony over the world. The policy staff think tank warned that the major aspiration of the Soviet Union was to spread communism across the world at any cost, to make Moscow the ideological and political center of world communism and eventually to have unopposed global domination. Quite simply, NSC 68 painted a very grim picture of Soviet intentions as these were, quote, wholly irreconcilable, unquote, with those of what it called the free world. Now let's see what the document prescribed 